Hello, my name is David Ansara, host of the Solutions Podcast. Every Sunday at 7 a.m., I release a new episode of the show, and I've done so now for 50 weeks. So in order to commemorate a year of the Solutions Podcast, I thought I would look back on some of the highlights of my discussions and identify some of the key themes that have emerged over the last year. What follows is a series of short extracts from longer conversations. I've linked to all of those full interviews in the description below. And what I've done with this episode is identify a few key themes that have emerged. And the first section of this show will deal with political institutions in South Africa and our system of governance. The second theme will look at how to preserve safety and security and livelihoods in South Africa. And the third section looks at the importance of political decentralization. I feature several guests from abroad in that section. My name is David Ansar. It's been a pleasure hosting the show over the last year. I encourage you to leave your thoughts in the comments section below. I've also put timestamps in the description. So if you would like to navigate to different sections of this episode, I would encourage you to do so and follow your interests there and sit back, relax, and enjoy. In this section, we explore South Africa's political and economic institutions. I speak with Helen Ziller about the need for community-based bottom-up initiatives in the absence of a capable state. I also speak with Richard Wilkinson about the importance of political federalism, as well as Piet Leroux, the CEO of Sarkelicher, about the need for business organizations to develop parallel institutions from the state. Okay, so that's party politics, but not everybody is politically involved. Some people just want to uh, preserve their communities or their families. And in the book, you go into some detail about the different ways in which communities are self-organizing. You refer to uh, the role of the private sector. You also look at uh, movements like the Solidarity Movement, uh, which has a, a kind of a, a self-sufficiency uh, philosophy to it. Um, do you think that in the absence of political change, these bottom-up community-led initiatives are going to be uh, the source of real fundamental change in South Africa? Indeed, I do. I believe that um, both are essential. I don't think it's an either-or. I think you desperately need political parties that can build a new majority, and you can only do that in South Africa if you span across the lines of racial identity. You can only do that. And that job is really very important. But it is not mutually exclusive of other initiatives that seek to look after marginalized groups in one way or another. And they have been very successful and uh, have done an enormous amount of work, good work, in a context of an increasingly failing state. And the tragic irony is that the people who keep on voting for the party that is leading us into a failed state continue to do so while expecting the private sector and others to pick up the slack for the state's failure. And until people learn that a failed state must result in a change of vote, we're not going to have rapid progress on that front. Richard, underpinning our conversation today has been this assumption mm -hmm. that federalism is a good thing, that decentralization is beneficial. Uh, but maybe yeah. some of our viewers and listeners don't share that assumption. Why do you think that this idea of subsidiarity or, or devolution of power is an important one? Yeah. And, and how is it related to democratic governance? Well, I think it's important because it allows for a pluralism of views to be expressed in a democracy. Uh, and it allows for your country to effectively develop on a number of different screens, and you can see, you can see things on a, on a split screen basis. South Africa has been dominated by one party rule for for thirty years, and so the only province where there's been any alternative has been the Western Cape. Um, and I think that's a pity. You know, I, I would have liked to have seen the IFP govern KwaZulu Natal, and and to see the DA govern the Western Cape and Gauteng. And, and maybe there could be another party somewhere else. And then you could have a situation where there can be experimentation uh, across large sections of government. And, and I, you know, it, it's a pity that the provinces aren't afforded more power. And it's a pity that the DA isn't doing more on the legislative front. Because, you know, I mean, right the way across government, we could be governing in a slightly different way in each province. And we can see which one works best. We've got a, a national education curriculum and a national matric exam 
you know, I, I don't think that the Western Cape has really taken this on. It would be a lot of work, but you know, why don't we have different curriculums in different provinces with different exams? So do, do we have to follow a one size fits all approach? If we were to change the blood alcohol level in, in one province, could we then not measure what impact that has uh, on road traffic fatalities and on the burden on, on the healthcare system? Could, could the Western Cape not implement uh, school vouchers and effectively privatize uh, the supply of public education? Could we not uh, be legalizing the sale of, of marijuana in, in a province? Um, you know, th these, these are all interesting questions. And I think it would provide greater texture to the national debate and it would allow people to discuss public policy more rather than discussing the same old tired uh, themes in South African politics, which is basically identity politics and corruption. Um, and uh, I think that's a bit stale. I think it would be nice to have a vibrant democracy with a diversity of public policy options on offer. Yeah, Richard, I mean, I think something else that's interesting to observe is as ANC governance continues to fall short, uh, you're mm -hmm. having, particularly at the municipal level, communities starting to take control over the basic administration of the state, waterworks, uh, electricity yeah. distribution, et cetera. Um, so in many ways, South Africa is disaggregating that as the ANC tries to centralize, that creates yeah. policy failure, which strengthens their desire to centralize even further. So, I mean, there are also other forces at play here where there is a natural tendency for governance to be breaking down and communities taking, uh, taking matters yeah. into their own hands. I mean, how do you see that playing into this discussion? Yeah, look, that's absolutely right. I mean, we, we, you can see that on almost every level. Um, where government fails, you then have the emergence of privatized solutions, whether it's solar panels, private security, private education, private health. Um, and what you're now seeing is a pushback by governments against those private, private solutions. Governments trying to take away private health care, trying to take away or trying to regulate or frustrate efforts to install private, uh, private power solutions and this is an area where i think that well i, I you know it, it's something that's happening on, on a de facto basis you don't require legislation for this to happen people are pressing for more and more uh, private control and community-based control uh where they're taking matters into their own hands and that doesn't require provincial legislation but i do think that the province the western Cape province should be trying to take control of the legislative agenda so that they can protect the private sector um, you know, I, it, it requires, you need to be an expert in the, in the different, different sectors to be able to speak about it fluently. But for example, pharmaceuticals, what is the situation? Are the pharmaceuticals, pharmaceutical industry overregulated? Uh, is the education sector overregulated? How difficult is it to start a private school in South Africa? Uh, when it comes to agriculture, is agriculture overregulated? The tourism industry seems to be subjected to draconian uh, rules and, and regulations. A big one is disaster management. Uh, disaster management, believe it or not, is a concurrent function of government. So the National Disaster Management Act exists and was used by the president to impose all of these lockdown conditions. There, uh, there is no Western Cape Disaster Management Act, which I think is a huge failure. And I would have liked to have seen a Western Cape Disaster Management Act conflict with, with national legislation, potentially, not necessarily, but potentially prevailing over national legislation um, so that you can protect the private sector so that you can have um, the private sector enabled to effectively uh, come up with solutions in the absence of government performance. And uh, that sadly hasn't happened to the extent that I would have liked in, in the Western Cape. Um, I think what businesses should do today is not entirely novel. In fact, we should just reapply some of the tried and tested principles of institution building. Um, we are used today, yes, to the modern state as we have come to know it in the last century or two, very centralized, um, does not uh, at least uh, on paper um, allow for negotiation with uh, private entities or private enterprises, wants a monopoly on power, and that's all good and well on paper, but in practice, um, sovereignty um, uh, is uh, is um, sovereignty on paper looks good, but in practice, uh, institutions can be built, they can be reformed, and they can operate in parallel. And so this is where I think um, the strategy for businesses working together today should be. It should be to um, firstly reform the institutional environment where possible. Secondly, um, 
state proof or protect its members against the remaining harmful interventions of that institutional environment. Um, but thirdly, providing and building alternative institutions within which and on which to do business, regardless of the level of state failure and the effectiveness of the state institutions. And I can give some examples of each of them, um, if that's okay with you. Please do, Pete, go ahead. So uh, on, the, uh, on the reform side, um, uh, let's say we have the um, expropriation without compensation debate currently in South Africa. Um, what is wonderful to see is a real uptake in the level of engagement and, uh, and uh, uh, lobbying that is being exerted and influence being exerted on government. Businesses uh, working together is, uh, and uh, um, uh, uh, raising their voices together is much more effective than doing so individually. And this is where this distinction comes in. I said earlier that you can individually figure out what to do for your business, uh, how to state with yourself, but you can't, it's not a one man band to, uh, to change the environment for doing business. So um, uh, if the first example I'd like to give of how we can work together to change the institutions for business um, is by um, influencing and reforming government. So we can approach government, we can uh, discuss, uh, we can be forceful, we can be adamant, we can be, uh, we can be friendly, or we can be, uh, we can be hard if it's necessary to, to change the, the policy environment as developed by government. Um, but then we're, we're very reactionary uh, in this, um, and it's okay, but it's a reactionary uh, type of thing to do. What, what becomes more interesting is when we say, okay, we've now attempted to change BE, we've, we've uh, warned against it, we've, uh, we've, we've, uh, but now it's there. Then we, we, we go to the second step of the second level of, of the strategy, which is to start and uh, protect the businesses against that intervention. But it's really hard to protect yourself against BE. You need some um, lightning rods. For example, in this case, Sarkalicha took on some BE cases, and it's much easier for Sarkalicha to be on the radar with regard to BE, explain why it's a failed policy, why it's harmful, uh, do so in a tactful way, um, as, 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 as professionally as possible, but still be forthright that BE is a harmful and failed policy. Um, start the necessary court cases and make sure that we cut off the harmful edges uh, or, or the, 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 um, the, the harmful aspects of BE as much as we can and prevent its expansion and application to new, uh, new areas of business. This is the protection, uh, the protect area. But then this will bring us to the even more exciting, I think, third strategic course of action for businesses working together, and that is developing alternative institutions for doing business, saying that let's imagine for a second that there were, that there were no government there were no state and we for some reason there was a collapse of government we have to find a way of doing business it's our responsibility how can we do that well we need to establish ways of of, of trusting each other we need to establish ways of connecting with each other we need to uh, we need to do this in a way that does not depend on third parties but we, we have to provide this ourselves and this is where alternative dispute resolution comes in um, this is where uh, networks and codes of conduct come in self-regulation it's a tried and tested concept in the in the media world it's a tried and con tested concept all throughout history for different sectors but um, uh, but again, I think it becomes more and more relevant as the state becomes either more hostile or less able to provide the institutional environment in which we should operate, then maybe we can provide some of these things ourselves through, through examples such as, um, as this uh, private dispute resolution, codes of conduct, uh, or even uh, what the, what the uh, new uh, digital economy and the digital infrastructure to our, uh, to our um, uh, offers us is uh, networks online, um, putting people directly in business, uh, working together with each other, irrespective of national borders. The year 2021 will be remembered for the devastating riots which swept through KwaZulu-Natal and Gauteng. This prompted me to discuss issues of community safety and security. I spoke with Khirin Yobe, Ian Cameron, as well as my former colleague at the Center for Risk Analysis, Franz Krenier. Uh, Khirin, you do a lot of work with these kinds of community policing forums and other groups. Uh, obviously, people need to go back to their normal day jobs, their day-to-day -day lives, uh, but there seems to have been this kind of new emergent energy that has, that has bubbled up from the bottom. 
but how do we now create more sustainable institutional structures around uh, what developed last week? So if you if you think about, let's just talk about the concept of policing in isolation quickly. So if you go back to the original Peelian principles of policing originating with Sir Robert Peel in the early 19th century, when he was tasked with essentially reforming the London Metropolitan Police, specifically due to the fact that so, such low levels of social trust in the police existed, it was it created its own crisis. And he had a, he had a, a wonderful list of about nine or ten principles. One of which is you can only police a community with its consent. But one of the other principles was that a police officer or police official is nothing other than an ordinary citizen who merely concerns himself or herself with the duties of enforcing law and order on a full time basis, and therefore has professionalized it for remuneration. Their rights and privileges are exactly the same, except that due to that due to that specific concern they are obviously granted additional powers that that normal average citizens do not possess who do not concern themselves with those tasks. Now, that is the essence of community policing. And I think what we've seen here is we've seen the complete failure of centralized structures. It's impossible in South Africa that we have a national police service that essentially managed from Pretoria, and it must succeed in addressing a myriad of extremely varied challenges across numerous provinces uh, in, a, in a nation with 11 official languages, many cultural disparities, many socioeconomic challenges that, that manifest in extremely different ways uh, across the overall geographic space. That sort of centralized problem solving, if one could even call it that, just is not effective. The best way to go forward with this is a form of federalizing your police response almost along county policing levels or provincial, then county, and even sort of uh, town or, or, or suburban with an extremely strong cooperation or buy-in element by the local population who I think, for want of a better word, are certainly not apathetic about their own security at the moment. I mean, if you've been manning a checkpoint or a line or, or protecting your community actively for three or four days straight, you are very much uh, involved in, in your own safety. And if we can take that same attitude forward and citizens make the decision that they're no longer willing to relinquish that responsibility to the state, but that there, there must be an immediate localized process where they can be directly involved that would have great results and that's a model that you can take from a, a upper middle class suburb uh, straight into a rural township the that devolution of management will definitely work or I should say bear its own fruit that would be the first thing the second thing is to look at that that concept that active citizen concept and expand it just beyond you know, the policing function. It's, just, it's the same thing. You, you could have that level of community response in the event of medical emergencies. You can, you, you, can build, you can take these existing structures and integrate them into a bigger machine whilst leaving them independent and flexible and answerable to their immediate communities, but that you can coordinate strongly in the event of any larger disaster. And I mean, yes, we faced mass public violence and riots now, but you could use the same exact same principle in responding to a hurricane or an earthquake or any other natural disaster of or mass casualty event that you need people to secure an area in order for help to arrive and humanitarian aid to roll out. And that might still need to happen in Durban, depending upon the resource constraints as that manifests going further down, uh, down from our present point. So there's, there, is, there is the solution. The solution has proven itself. It's now a question of integrating that solution into the overall framework, but there needs to be reform from government side uh, in order for that to actually work. Yeah, and you mentioned the work that you're doing now that you've moved down to the Western Cape, uh, working directly with communities. And last week on the podcast, we had Jordan Hill Lewis, the DA's mayoral candidate for the city of Cape Town, and I posed some of these questions around community safety to him. And he was very quick to point to some of the successes that the city's had in terms of the metals theft unit that it's established, uh, as well as the uh, law enforcement advancement plan 
the LEAP program, uh, which uh, is basically putting uh, provincial and city boots on the ground, uh, trying to uh, deal with uh, instances of violent crime in areas like Grassy Park and others, which uh, have been really beset by gang violence. And uh, I noticed that, that you wrote an article in News 24 recently talking about the importance of the devolution of the police uh, to the provincial level and using the Western Cape as a kind of a, a test case or a, a pilot for this kind of uh, dissemination of, of police powers to the more local level. What are some of your proposals there and how do you think that those could play out uh, in, the, in the Western Cape? Yeah, so, so firstly, I think the... the the major thing would, would, would also be important, or the major thing to, to also mention is that we fully support the, the way that um, the Western Cape government, specifically the city of Cape Town, has gone about uh, the LEAP unit uh, development. And, uh, and I think that's the direction to go into. I think uh, using that as a foundation or a, or a, 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 a starting point is uh, is important because it goes to show that you actually get what you vote for now with that i'm not promoting a specific party but what i am saying is that it's the only province in the country where we've seen this type of development actually occurring successfully uh, happening despite the fact that south african police service is failing um, and, and not just failing literally falling apart how do we see it playing out I think we see it playing out that we can then uh, manage resources far more accurately. We can pick up the um, the pieces when it comes to the 5,000 vacancies in the South African Police Service in the Western Cape. And we can make sure that resources are, uh, are, uh, are, uh, resources are given to people in the right places where they need it. Uh, unfortunately, we don't see appropriate resource uh, management currently in the South African Police Service. Uh, the anti-gang unit in the Western Cape was disbanded not 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 long ago by Becky Tele, and obviously that means that we're just facing even more gang violence, and that many of these communities are left on their own. So, if it if it is not uh, or if the devolution does not take place, it simply means more people will die at the at the hands of the current ruling party. Uh, it it is that simple. Uh, we we need to find that type of uh, uh, system that that can work. Just lastly, David, something that's important. You mentioned Grassy Park. Now, Grassy Park has a thousand eight hundred people per police member, and the UN average is about two hundred per police member. So they are way 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 ahead of anyone else in South Africa. In fact, it's probably the worst ratio in the country. And one must ask whether this is not a deliberate, uh, a deliberate campaign by the ruling party and specifically national government to make things more difficult in the Western Cape. Yeah, and obviously uh, Schedule 4 of the Constitution, which I have here, uh, talks about the uh, exclusive competencies of the provinces and the shared competencies, shared competencies being health and education and so on. But Section 146 of the Constitution also deals with conflicting laws. So 1461 uh, says that it applies to conflict between national legislation and provincial legislation uh, falling within a functional area listed in Schedule 4. And then Subsection 2 says national legislation that applies uniformly with regard to the country as a whole prevails over provincial legislation. And it lists uh, a number of um, conditions there. So obviously there are some pretty significant legal and constitutional obstacles to that. But, you know, I think uh, political pressure um, can work in terms of driving more of an impetus towards devolution. And we now see the DA kind of responding to that, including a, uh, you know, a private members bill that's been put before parliament uh, to enact referenda at the provincial level. So they're clearly seeing, seeing the need to more aggressively assert the interests of the province and also the city of Cape Town. The point is we need to just get it done. We don't, we, we mustn't wait for the South African police service or for the ANC to give us the go ahead because that's never going to happen. So if we want to build a sustainable future, we need to get it done. We need to get communities involved. We need to mobilize them and, uh, and we need to develop more uh, law enforcement advancement programs. The more of those we have in the country, uh, the safer more people will be. 
And, uh, and if we do that, we can also decrease corruption in law enforcement in South Africa, because it's, just, it's, it's as simple as the basic rule of competition, that if we've got different enforcement agencies that work close by or close to each other, there's a natural thing between humans that we want to compete and the one wants to be better than the other. So they, they, they keep each other accountable. It's almost like cross pollination. They keep each other accountable. The one points fingers to the other, and I don't think it's an unhealthy system if it's managed in the right way. So it's just to add to that, we need to simply just get it done. Just start somewhere and uh, and build the alternative system instead of waiting for the ruling party to do something because they are not going to. So the thinking has evolved over the years. In the book, we said, make it simple. Divide your life into four boxes and think of yourself in four boxes. The first box is 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 what money you have if you have any and some people most people have a little bit of money what 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 are you doing with that and what are the risks the second box we said we want you to think about is what you do your your career and your business uh, where do you do it how do you do it and uh, can you do something else and you know we, the risk we sort of flag we'll go into the detail now is you know if if you work only if you had a business that contracted only to the state, we'd say that you've got a problem. The if, if your business is entirely invested in fixed assets, yeah, we'd say you, you, you're running a risk. Third thing we asked you to think about is, is where in the world can you be? Are you stuck to one place or can you move? And that might mean moving uh, from from Gauteng as Johannesburg crumbles into the Cape that might hold up better. It could be moving to another part of the world. Do you have those choices? And the fourth box we asked you to think about is your children because your, your children matter to you and that they have a future is often very much more important than whether you have a future as, as a person. And are you preparing your children to be globally competitive in the event that South Africa is not it mustn't be their only option. And we understand completely that it's tough to make create to cover all those boxes for any family. But the advice is create as many choices in each box as you possibly can. Because the more choices you have, the more robust you're going to be. If you have no choices in any of those boxes, you're stuck in the north of Johannesburg. You contract to a government department or agency. You can never leave or go anywhere else. All the money pension you have is in is here and in, in the state, in, 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 the, in the RAND, in, in, in the country. And your, your kid's only option is to follow in your footsteps. That individual is running a very high degree of risk that if South Africa goes wrong, their life experience is going to be very harsh. If you become something else, let's say you, you, you are able to save a bit of money and, and, and go for some diversification. We don't give financial advice or investment advice, none, ever. We give strategic insights. Go talk to your advisor and they'll, they'll, they'll give you some ideas. You know, make sure your kids are as well educated as they could ever be so that that's a good investment for your South African rounds so that they do have the option to be competitive in the rest of the world. If they get the chance to travel after school, give them the opportunity. If they can go and work overseas, gain some experience, they can come back. Your business, try not to be dependent on large corporates and government work or overly dependent on fixed infrastructure in the country. The ideal is a small, is a business that can work for clients here and around the world and and a, a broad spread so that if a large corporation you know comes to you and says well your be figures not up to standard we're booting you but that's that's not the end of you or the government says we've run out of money now or says you must pay a large bribe uh, and and you don't you you shouldn't do that then then you're then you're free and and that where in the world can you be do you have to be in one location can you start making a, a plan to change location and get yourself into a community that understands that as the state retreats, 
you in that community better be prepared and willing to take on what were its functions if you are to become a robust community. So that's what the advice later became. And I, we, we still now and again mention it in public here and there. You don't get the criticism we used to get for being crazy or way out or so on. And I think anyone who ended up queuing in Durban for eight hours to get into a supermarket to buy a loaf of bread would have been able to spend that eight hours productively pondering the merits of our 2000 and whatever, 13 or whatever it was advice. What is the role played by political decentralization and individual freedom in terms of guaranteeing human prosperity? These are questions that I considered with several of my international guests, Douglas Carswell, Stephen Davies, and Johan Norberg. In this final section, I bring you some perspectives from abroad. So Douglas, one of the themes of this podcast is decentralization, subsidiarity. And in South Africa, we have many uh, harmful economic policies that emanate from the center, from Pretoria, uh, which inhibit economic activity. And we've had a number of people on the podcast arguing for greater degrees of decentralization to counter that. Uh, what is your view on the importance of devolving power and how does that practically work and, and what is the effect of that? Decentralizing power is absolutely critical for any society to be successful, whether it's a small society like Switzerland, which has different cantons that make policy autonomously, or at the other extreme, the United States of America, which is a United States of America. Each state has tremendous autonomy. Whether you're big or small, having regional autonomy is critical. And the reason why it's critical is because no one group of administrators ever knows enough to know what the future looks like, and therefore knows, never knows enough to get regulation and public policy right. If you allow different parts of a country to do things differently, you get innovation. And in getting that innovation, you get to replicate what works. Take, take, for example, the United States response to COVID. We've had, in effect, 50 different responses to COVID because outside federal buildings and airlines, depending on which state you're in, you've had different mask mandates, different requirements to do different things, different social distancing measures. And, and the rest of the United States can see that and can work out what, what works. But in a country like the United Kingdom, where you have an incredibly high degree of centralization, you, you never get to see what works. And so errors go undetected and mistakes are, are piled upon mistakes. And it's not just in tackling COVID that you see this. Centralization means that you get public policy errors in all areas of um, policymaking. The real success for a successful the, the, the key for success in, in any society, I think, is to disperse power outward and, and downward. That means uh, regionally, but also amongst competing institutions. It's no coincidence that in South Africa, you know, you traditionally had, I think, the, the, the court located in Bloemfontein and the parliament located in, in one area and, and the government, the executive exactly. located in, a, in another area. I, that that Disperse the power may have been uh, more theoretical than, 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 than practical, um, but I think it's incredibly important that South Africa re re returns to that tradition of dispersed power. The great success stories in, in human history are those body politics that are able to ensure that no one faction has absolute control. Um, it, it's particularly important, I think in countries where there are different traditions and heritages. Um, I, I think one of the reasons why Uganda today, a country that I'm, I'm very fond of, is much more politically stable, is because although it's a unitary state, it's a unitary state with a high degree of regional autonomy now. The restoration of traditional rulers, the restoration of some of the rights of traditional rulers, I don't just mean the Baganda's Kabaka, but um, in Banyoro and, and, and other kingdoms, the, the devolving of power and authority away from the administrative state in the capital Kampala to different 
uh, regional groups. I, I, I think this is key to explaining why uh, Uganda is, is, is um, a much more stable political country. Giving, giving different South Africans greater control over what happens in their locality, their neighborhood, their town, their city, their state, I think that's the key to a harmonious and successful society. If everything's run um, by a political elite in Pretoria, or everything's run by a political elite in Washington, D.C. or London, um, the stakes become far too high for everyone else in the country to not have political power. And politics then becomes a very dangerous contest for absolute power and control. Yeah, in many ways, that's a theme consistently in this podcast is bottom-up solutions to some of the world's most intractable problems. And the opposite of that is top down. And in many respects, I think the political rebellions that we're starting to see across Europe and, and elsewhere are a, a symptom of a kind of a reaction against this idea that, well, if you can just outsource politics to this bureaucratic elite, and then people who uh, basically don't have the means uh, to uplift themselves, they must just be wards of the state and mm -hmm. must just subsist off of welfare and and uh, you know, vote loyally for uh, for their technocratic yeah. masters at, at each election. Yeah. But I think that that is a denial of and a misunderstanding of how democracy actually works and and how oh, uh, politics is expressed at the ballot box. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's I mean basically there's a very old old word to describe people in that kind of relationship to their social superiors, and that's serfs. Uh, the, the idea is that you are, if, if you think about that approach to politics, what it does is to deny agency and therefore dignity and self-respect to ordinary people. You're basically seen as idiots who don't know what's good for you, whereas the experts apparently do, uh, and who therefore have to be either told what to do, or if that's not possible, nudged uh, into doing the right thing, uh, using the techniques that Thaler and Sunstein sort of outline in their book with that name. And I think that's a profoundly illiberal uh, and morally repulsive vision of politics. Uh, and it's not surprising this caused a huge backlash. Now, the problem is that the form the backlash has taken is sometimes a form of kind of highly destructive populism in which you have people who have no positive positive policy agenda uh, other than hostility to the elite. And then once they get into power, of course, it becomes very apparent they have no idea what to do and they become part of the establishment themselves. Okay, uh, five or, star, the Five Star Movement uh, in Italy. Yeah, precisely. Example. Five Star in Italy is a classic example of that. And there are, there are many other examples of it. Um, or on the other hand, you have uh, demands for highly, highly destructive politics, what you might call the moon on a stick kind of politics, uh, of which I think things like the economic freedom fighters in South Africa are, are an example. Or you get the idea that, yes, you do need a reassertion of actual proper democratic politics, but this can only take place at the national level. Now, that's a very seductive route because one of the things that people are reacting against is the tendency that you mentioned to outsource a lot of political debate and argument to experts who are actually very often at the supranational level. So what democratic voters are, electorates are told constantly in country after country is, oh, you can't do X because of some international agreement that uh, the, the country they're citizens of has entered into. This was particularly noticeable in the EU, but you can see it all over the world. And so an enormous amount of areas of what would have been uh, topics for political argument, debate, contestation, are now handed over to um, bureaucratic or technocratic elites who are not even national. They are associated with and affiliated with international bodies like the IMF, the World Bank, uh, the WTO, uh, all the various alphabet soup of agencies that the United Nations has, or organizations like the EU. And that is all, it's not surprising, confronted with that, that the response is to say, well, what we need to do is to reassert the political role and function of national governments. Now, the danger with that, of course, is that what it leads to is national competition and beggar my neighbor economic policies. And the real ultimate danger, of course, is it leads to war because of the breakdown of international order. And this is what happened, of course, in the central decades of the 20th century with the results that we all know about. So I think that the actual appropriate solution is to say that what you want to do is to adopt, as you describe it, the bottom-up approach to politics, to emphasize rather the role of civil society and principles of subsidiarity, the old Roman Catholic principle that decisions should always be made at the lowest possible level. Uh, and also to emphasize 
the value of um, non-experts, uh, of local knowledge, tacit knowledge, uh, informal knowledge, as opposed to the uh, credentialed knowledge uh, of the expert class, the people with degrees from Harvard and Cambridge and uh, Whitwater's Rand, if you want to think about it, in the South African context and places like that. Uh, and you know, also, finally, to constantly look for a system where the people who make decisions uh, actually have, in Nassim Nicholas Taleb's expression, skin in the game. In other words, they're going to bear a loss if they get it wrong. One of the big problems with this technocratic politics is that the people who make decisions, they, they only have, they have no exposure to downside risk. If they make a major screw up, they get something wrong, they do not bear a personal cost. Uh, whereas they get lots of kudos and praise if they get it right. And that's not an environment that's conducive to good or effective decision making. And Johan, I was struck in your book by a theme that, that ran through it like a golden thread, which is that individual freedom leads to prosperity. And I'd like you to comment about that relationship between those two concepts. And why is it necessary for individuals to be free to pursue their own economic ends? And how does that help to benefit society as a whole? Because we don't know how to benefit society as a whole. Um, and that's the problem with any kind of authoritarian leadership. It replaces a discovery process with the uh, decisions by uh, a tiny group at the top. And this is a, historically, a historical fallacy that we've seen again and again. Any kind of enrichment is about learning something new, coming up with new ideas on how to improve a production process or how to uh, produce something better, faster or cheaper for others and finding new markets for those products. And that, if you're looking for something, the best way of finding it is to set millions and billions of people free to go about and searching for it in their own way. And that's what we learn from technology history, whatever you look at, it could be the invention of something trivial, like um, the zipper or um, the bicycle or something complex as a personal computer, or an mRNA vaccine. It's a complex discovery process of it's not a bolt of genius. And it's certainly not a committed decision. It's about thousands of people going about their own business, trying to find out a way of improving something. And then we get this process of clashes, combinations, trial and error, uh, feedback from uh, users and the market and pushback and adaptation again and again. That's how we end up with something uh, astonishing. And that's a reason why we need individual freedom, not because it's cute, it is, <laughs> and it's a, it has the moral <laughs> high ground, I would say. But uh, when it comes to hi world history, its main consequence is that people will then do things that we couldn't have predicted. People will surprise us because they've seen things and they've experienced things and they have local information that we wouldn't be able to predict. And um, when they do that, they will stumble onto all the things that make our societies great. Thanks for watching this retrospective of the Solutions with David Ansara podcast. I've really enjoyed hosting the show over the last year, and I look forward to many fascinating conversations in the future. Please do join me for those. Also, if you're watching on YouTube, please like this video and subscribe to the channel. If you're listening on your preferred audio platform, please do leave a review there as well and share it with your friends or family who may find it of interest. My name is David Ansara. Until next week, take care.